and wait for the word that has been given. God calls and welcomes us back to worship this day. Let us celebrate and rejoice in God's presence forever. Let us worship God together. Please remain standing. We'll be singing hymn 400 in the United Methodist Hymnal, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. be seated. A reading from 1st Timothy chapter 1 verses 12 through 17. I, Paul, am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service even though I was formerly a blasphemer a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If there are any children here today, I invite you to come forward, and, and certainly online, I, I imagine Simon and Robbie are with us. I heard that they are, they are sick with COVID, and so we are hoping that they will um, be well soon. And I think...
So I have a question for you this morning. Do any of you know how many people are in your school? Has anybody told you the total population? Get out of here. Do you know that? I, was gonna, I thought I was going to have to sit up here and do some mental math and estimating and carrying on, but 435, that's a pretty good-sized school. Do you, do you guys have any idea? About, no, but it's probably somewhere around there. You think five or 600 is what you're thinking? But then people got moved or not as many people came. Yeah. All right. So you've had a couple of weeks of school now right now, and so um, you are... Uh, you're kind of getting comfortable where you are. So in addition to that four or 500 people, children that are in your school, you have, what, all the teachers, and you have the principals, and you have the custodians who keep the place clean, and the cafeteria workers who help feed you, and probably some other people I'm forgetting about, the guidance counselor, other teach specialists. Yeah, all those people. Music teacher, right, yeah, art. Oh, good. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, P. Oh. Yeah, it's hard to lose special teachers, right? It really is. So I want to tell you something about every one of those five or 600 people, or 700 if you count everybody in the school, and that is this. Jesus says that God knows and loves every one of them. And that includes you, which is really nice to know that, you know, even though you're part of a crowd, God knows and loves you and keeps an eye on you, right? And sometimes thinking that God loves me makes me feel safe and it makes me feel kind of special. I hope it does you too. But I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the meanest kid in your school. Just, you don't tell me. We're not going to out anybody here. But just think about the meanest kid that you know at school. And this is the thing that is hard for us to remember or believe sometimes, but God loves that kid too. Think about your grumpiest teacher. And you know, I was a teacher and some days I was grumpy. I carried on. Think about your grumpiest teacher. God loves and cares for that teacher too. So it's amazing, right, that God cares for the smarty pants and the, and the uh, stuck-up kids and the grumpy adults, but God does care for all. And you know what else? God wants you to know them and care for them the best you can. You know, sometimes people won't let us care for them, but sometimes they do need friends, right? Sometimes a teacher needs a, a little encouragement. Can you imagine that? Teachers need a little encouragement sometimes, a little thank you. And kids that are having trouble getting along, they probably need a little help from you too. Because God's hope for us at school and in the church, too, whoops, careful there, is that we're going to be a community that cares for each other. And in a minute, you're going to hear uh, uh, Ms. Sni- Ms. Snively read a scripture that talks about God searching for people who seem lost. So I want you to listen as she reads, and then I'll be talking about it a little later, too. Okay? All right, let's pray. God, we give you thanks for our schools, and we pray for each person in that school that that person will feel welcome and a part of the community. We pray the same thing for our church. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming up. I'll see you later. Oh, and while they're going back, let me just say this. I forgot to mention people who have birthdays. Uh, Mary Vital and um, Jasmine Abraham have birthdays this week. If you know those folks, um, shoot them a text or a card or a, a phone call and just wish them a happy birthday. And again, sorry about that.
<laughs> Yay. A reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the good news. Praise, Praise to you, O oh Christ. Christ. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Excuse me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Beth Ludlam, a United Methodist elder in the Baltimore-Washington Conference who serves at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., um, lived in China for a, a time some years ago. And not too long after she moved there, she was invited by a, a friend to go to her cousin's wedding in a little remote village. And when they arrived at the bride's home, the family surrounded her, and they began a debate back and forth. And she, of course, she had no idea what was going on. And eventually, her friend said, well, as a foreigner, you are our guest of honor, and so you have to be the bridesmaid, right? The, it's actually the, uh, the maid of honor. Imagine that, right? And so with that, the, the next several hours became a blur of the usual things that go on in weddings. There, were, there was celebration and dancing and food and music, and there were even the obligatory toast. You know how the maid of honor and the, the, the groomsmen have to make toast, right? And her friend said, oh, just say anything in English. I'll make it sound good when I translate it. <laughs> and so she did. And she said her favorite part of the day was when they were going to the place where the, the ceremony was going to be. And they were processing through the streets, some in their cars, some in buses, some on foot. And, and they were honking and they were calling out to the neighbors. The whole community was welcomed, even the poorest person in the community. And certainly this one overwhelmed and a little bit confused foreigner. Well, today we have before us in Luke's gospel two parables from the gospel of Luke. And, and many say that uh, these parables, along with the one that follows it, which is the parable of the prodigal son, you know, that's the one where the, the son asked for his inheritance and went off and lost it all and then came to his senses and came home to his father. All of those three are the heart of Luke's gospel. They're kind of central in, in position, but they're also uh, the heart theologically. The heart of what Luke wants to say about a compassionate God who desires that everyone should be found 
and this really good news that when they're found, there is joy in heaven. Joy in heaven as well as on earth. And if you think about it, Luke's gospel has a lot of joyous celebrations right in the beginning when uh, Jesus is born and the angels appear to the shepherds and they sing glory to God in the highest. And the shepherds get excited and they rejoice too. And of course the, the, the party that's thrown for the, the wayward son who comes home, a big celebration. Uh, the, the ten lepers who are healed and go away rejoicing. Hmm. Zacchaeus, remember him? He also, uh, there's great joy when he comes to be a part of the community of Jesus. And so this week, um, we're going to look at two aspects. Uh, uh, well, uh, first of all, let me just back up a minute. We're doing a fall sermon series about what disciples do, right? And so last week we learned that disciples of Jesus Christ take their faith seriously. It affects what they do with everything, their family, their friends, their, their money, their, their time. And this week we're going to look at these two other aspects of, of discipleship that are suggested by today's scripture. One is that disciples celebrate when the lost are found. They celebrate. Yeah. And... And also that disciples actually become a part of God's search party and welcoming committee. So we're going to talk about those two things. But first let's start with what Luke says. He says there are cr people crowding around Jesus one day. And the disciples are there. They're probably trying to learn more from Jesus, right? And the scribes and Pharisees are there. Maybe they're there to learn as well, but maybe they're also there to kind of keep tabs on what Jesus is up to. And then there are these people who are on the fringes, the, the tax collectors and the sinners. And you know, tax collectors were not loved by other Jewish people, even though they were Jewish themselves, because they saw them as collaborating with the oppressor, collaborating with Rome and taking money out of their pockets for Rome. And, and the sinners, well, we don't know the specific sins I guess they could be something heinous, or they could just be other things that might not seem so bad, like breaking some of the purity laws or, or not observing the Sabbath in exactly the correct way. Uh, they could be women whose husbands have divorced them. And, of course, you know, as they say, it was probably all the woman's fault, right? No, no. But anyway, any of those could have been included in that particular group of sinners, right? And we don't know the nature of the sin, but we do know it's very clear. Jesus is eating with these tax collectors and sinners. So on this day, they've crowded in to listen to. They're there. And then, you know, the crowd gets to grumbling. Now, we always put this on, uh, you know, it could have been anybody in the crowd, right? And they say, hmm, doesn't Jesus know who these people are? What they do? Hmm. Who invited them anyway? So instead of responding directly to the grumblers, you know, Jesus didn't, he, he always was just going to tell you a story, right? So instead of responding directly to the grumblers, he tells these uh, stories. A story about a shepherd who values the health and safety of one lost sheep. A story about a woman who values her hard-earned money. And then the one we didn't read today, the story about the father whose son, his youngest son, has taken his share of the inheritance and left home for some wild living in a far-off place. And as we listen in on these stories, maybe Jesus is asking us to imagine what it would be like if we lost the thing that we valued most. Think about that right now, that thing or that person that you value most. How even if we have to move on because life goes on uh, after the object of our love is permanently lost, we'll never be quite whole again. Hmm. 
And maybe Jesus wants his listeners to know that God's nature is love and God will never be quite whole again. So he go without everybody, so he goes out searching and looking for a sheep that's lost, right? A sheep that's so afraid and lost that it's probably curled up in a hiding place somewhere and it doesn't even know how to help itself get found. Or a, a coin that uh, is lost in a dark corner and there's no way it can help itself be found. I think Jesus is saying to those people standing at the fringes of the community, God is searching for you. And I think he's saying to those of the standing there who are a little bit surer of themselves, right, in their rightful place, he's saying, look at these folks you're grumbling about. Look at them. God's community is not going to be complete unless every one of them is included. And when one person goes missing from the kingdom of faith, even the weakest, the most troubled, the biggest sinner, the community is just not right. And when the community is strong enough to include everyone, we're all a lot better off. Amen. Amen. You know, we we jump into the theme of repentance in these parables, and that is a theme that's there. And boy, especially with that wretched, no good son, you know, rehearsing his his, um, apology to his father and hoping the father will take him back. But if we only focus on that, then we're missing a really important part of this lesson of, of, of these parables who's, where the theme of joy and celebration are dominant. Like the Chinese village that rejoiced because an outsider was joining in the wedding celebration. The people of God are called to rejoice when uh, our community is made complete by the return of even one person who has been wandering. And if Jesus is calling anyone to repentance in these stories, and he is, he is also surely calling those who seem unable to feel joy that those tax collectors and those sinners have drawn near to Jesus and the circle of people surrounding Jesus. So who are the lost The Pharisees and the scribes and and many of us, let's be honest, identify with the 99 sheep who have the good sense to stay with the shepherd. Or that those nine coins still tucked very safely in that woman's purse. Or the very responsible older brother who stays and never strays from home. but we sometimes kid ourselves, right? We say, I'm not lost. Those people are lost. That person that does X or Y or Z, that person is lost. But of course, if we're honest with ourselves, we know we all get lost. Maybe somebody even feels lost today. That beautiful hymn we sang, first hymn today, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Hmm. prone to leave the God I love. Those, those words always speak to me. But because of these stories of Jesus, I can trust that when I'm lost, God comes looking for me. God comes when my shame or my grief or my anger hurt feelings have led me to wander off in isolation. You know how sometimes you can be present, but you're not present? Yeah. God comes looking for me when I fail, or when I hurt someone, 
And boy, I don't ever want to do that, but I do. And as incredible as it may seem, God finds me and anyone else who is lost. And when that happens, there's rejoicing in heaven. Oh, rejoicing. And I'll tell you, I'm probably not at the end of my sinning. I wish I could say I was, but I'm probably not. And yet, the angels and all the company of heaven knowing that are still rejoicing. And if it's, that's true for you and, and for me, it's certainly true for others that we might imagine to be excluded from God's love. So what do disciples do? Well, we form this welcoming and rejoicing community, and we join God in, as I said, in searching for those who do not yet know, or maybe they've forgotten that God is looking for them and hoping, hoping they'll return home, that they will be found. So how do we do that? How do we join God in the search for those who might feel lost? So I'm going to remind you of three pretty basic ideas that you may have heard. I have heard. I'm sure you have, probably. Three ways that you can be an evangelist. Oh, please don't, don't shut down just because I said that, evangelist. Listen. First, we live our faith in a way that gives Christ a good name. As best we can, and by God's grace and God's grace alone, we are beacons of love and compassion and integrity and service and justice. Because I'm going to tell you, I don't think people outside the Christian faith are drawn to people with holier-than-thou attitudes. Or people who say hateful things and cover them over with this nice veneer of Christianity. Those are the kind of things that might feel good sometimes to us insiders, you know. You might like to feel a little superior. But they don't entice many to want to come close to God. As a matter of fact, and this is just my opinion, I think those kind of behaviors actually um, harm the church's witness to people standing on the outside looking in. We're all going to fall down in living out God's love, but with God's grace we get up again, right? We do it. And with God's grace we live in a way that we hope will make someone say, I want to know about what forms you and what motivates you. And that becomes our moment to speak to speak of the love of Christ. <clears throat> so first, we live our faith in a way that gives Christ a good name. And second, we share our faith in relational ways. You know, you know people, right? You know lots of people. You know your family and your friends and your coworkers. And every once in a while, there'll be that opening. These, this situation will allow us to use our words. You know that thing, uh, speak, uh, preach the gospel at all times if necessary, use words. Well, that's primary. But second, we do, we do have to use our words. Yeah. Well, God gave us these mouths, right? So let's use them. And, and so uh, you might... Um, just if somebody's saying, you know, I just feel so aimless and I don't know where I'm going, and I, you know, you just say, you know, it might be natural to say, you know, my faith in Christ gives me some grounding and some purpose. Hmm. Somebody's uh, looking at you, you know, you know, you're going out to help with the soup kitchen or you're delivering groceries that day, and they say, why in the world do you do that? And you say, well, you know, my faith in Christ motivates me to serve others. You might say to somebody who's, I don't know, maybe just, um, maybe a little down. If you feel it's the right moment to say it, you might just say, sometimes my faith in Christ unexpectedly will give me moments of deep joy. That song that you sang, that sunset, hmm. seeing someone do a loving act for others. 
deep joy. You might even say, man, things are tough. But, but Christ gives me some hope for the future, not just for the good old by and by in the sky, although I'm counting on that. I don't know about you, but I am counting on that. But not just for that, for the, uh, the, the tough times that we're living through, God can use in a way that builds our character. So I've talked about two things, living in a way that makes people, you know, that speaks well of Christ. Uh, saying you something when it seems appropriate to people you already know. And last, just invite people to come and see. I'm looking at somebody right now who's a good inviter of people to come and see. She's invited several people to this church. Have all of them come? No. But some of them have, right? And so we're grateful for that. That come and see. Uh, uh, and, and if we know, especially if we know somebody's lacking a faith community, we don't need to be stealing other people's people. That's not what, we're all on the same team, guys. You know. But if you know somebody's lacking a faith community, well, invite them to come. Just come and see. You may not like it, but come and see. Come to worship, or, or your kids might like Sunday school, or the, there's this crazy Bible school study about Revelation going on downstairs, or uh, uh, there's a community supper, something we want to get back to now that we're feeling better about COVID. Invite people to come and see. I'm just going to say it one more time. It's God's intent and purpose that every person should be found. And God is on the move in this world and in people's lives in ways that we cannot always understand. And it is God and God alone who ultimately saves. I can't save a soul. God saves. But it is our profound privilege and joy our profound privilege and joy as disciples of Jesus Christ to invite people to come, to open wide the doors of the community, and to rejoice with each other and with the angels every time we see that someone has come to make this community of faith more complete, more what it ought to be. offer these words to you today in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The hymn that we're about to sing, The King of Love, My Shepherd, is, is this beautiful combination of the 23rd Psalm, and then right in the middle you'll see inserted a verse about this parable. And so as we sing it, it's got some archaic language and all that, but it is a beautiful hymn. So I invite you now to stand and turn in your United Methodist hymnal to the King of Love, My Shepherd Is.
please be seated. Our pastoral prayer, um, some of it, is inspired by a prayer by Nathan Atwood. I want to give credit where credit's due. And during this season where we're thinking about discipleship, we're beginning our time of prayer with a time of silence and reflection. And so I invite you now to close your eyes or just soften your gaze and have a moment of quiet. Holy God, we praise you for the beauty of this day. Yes, this rainy day, O oh Lord. For this we give you thanks. And for the promise of all it offers us. We thank you for life, for joy, for every opportunity to walk with you. We thank you for new beginnings for our Sunday school and for the, the teachers who have given themselves this year to teaching. For the adults, we thank you for Jennifer and for um, uh, Lorraine and Julian and all the others who will lead that class. For our youth, we give you thanks for Lindsay and Brian and Matt and Elena who have offered themselves as teachers. For our elementary, we give you thanks for Sharon and for her long years of service as a teacher and caring for this age group. And for uh, uh, Pam, we thank you, Lord, for her care for our youngest. We celebrate today that uh, two among us are having birthdays this week, and so we pray for Mimi and for Jasmine Abraham. Lord, thank you for reminding us that all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. And that we're all prone to wander. There are times when we can't imagine what it would be like to, to leave you. And then one day we wake up and we wonder if we even know how to pray. We go through the motions. We may look just the same on the outside, but we are lost in a far-off country. But as easily as we know we wander, we are also quick to judge others when they wander. We want them to be held to high standards. We, we get tired of always doing your business of uh, drawing the wanderers back into your fold. We want people to take responsibility and do the right thing. Hmm. And when we wander, when they wander, we often act as if they should do some penance before we fully welcome them back into the family. So cleanse our hearts, Lord, and, and give us a new view of your heart. Make us like the shepherd who uh, was so happy when he found that lost lamb. Hmm. Help us to celebrate when people come to our community of faith, especially those we might think of as outsiders. Mm. For when they come, then we're really complete, Lord. And help us never to forget that we're always looking for that person who'll come and fill in the empty chair among us. Here are prayers for those who are on our hearts today. We pray for Paul Loback, grateful, Lord, that this, this man has been able to be moved back to Montgomery County. And we pray that you will comfort him and his family in his final days. 
We pray for, for Evelyn and for Elizabeth and Maria, Virginia, Evelyn, Julie, Karen, Jasmine, Carol, Terry, Janice, Tom and Fran, and Paul and Rose. And in this moment of silence, Lord, hear us if there are others on our hearts special to us as we raise their name to you. We pray for those who grieve, the people we know closely. We pray for the people of Great Britain today, knowing that they have lost Her Majesty the Queen, for her family as well. We ask your comfort. We pray for those who still suffer because of the attacks on the World Trade Center for those first responders or people who were present. Help us to remember the people who serve us and to say thank you. Thank you. Teach us the ways that lead to peace so that one day we may truly lay down our weapons of war. Lord, thank you for hearing this prayer. Thank you for your Son who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit and for the prayer that he left with us. Hear us as we pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In this season when we're talking about discipleship, I've asked some people to come up each week uh, and just share for a few minutes about, you know, why they've chosen to make their life of discipleship be connected with this church. And so today, um, Jabez Zulu, who's been here with us for several years now, come on up, and his family, is going to just share a little bit with us. So we invite him. Let's give him a hand for just coming up. Good morning, church. I am Jabez Zulu. I'm here with my wife, Charity, and Alex. The other three children are not with us. They are in school and the colleges back home in Zambia and uh, abroad. We come from Zambia, which is almost the southern part of Africa. 
and uh, one thing you, which is so popular about our country is just the, I think, the Victoria Force it could be one that could, you could have read. If not, please browse that on the internet. You read about that. But one thing which you sh we all cherish more back home is the warm heart of our country. Now, Zambia is a small country that got its independence in 1964, having been a British colony. And uh, after that, the new president of Zambia realized that there was need for the church to be strengthened. And the, one of the steps that were taken was the creation of the United Church of Zambia, which was an amalgamation of uh, about four Protestant churches, amongst them the Methodist Church. So the background to the UCZ is like that. And we belong to the United Church of Zambia back home. And then when we moved to the US in early 2019, we did not know where we would congregate. So in our first two weeks, we kept flipping through the pages of various newspapers and anything we could find until at one point when we looked through in the internet, we found Rockville United Methodist Church. So we came here in early February uh, on what was a mission to like test the waters and uh, we are so grateful to the warm welcome that you offered to me and my family on that first day. Amen. And um, through our interaction on that day, and uh, of course with, with Pastor Martha's uh, discussion we had, we went home, looked through all the doctrine of the church and everything else, and we decided that our home shall be at Rockville United Methodist Church. Also. And we've been here ever since. Now, there are several beliefs, practices, and fellowship that we've gone through. Uh, on the doctrine, it's almost the same with what we believe in. The warm heart of the people in this church is what has carried us through and through. Amen. You've been with us in several situations, in happy moments, in sorrowful moments, you've been with us. And of course, the latest having been going, going through the COVID situation, together with everyone here, we kept strengthened. We've got a daughter who is currently in Russia. You've been there for her through and through, and that has given us the strength to continue with our studies whilst away from home. We believe that God is here, and the Lord Almighty shall continue to strengthen us as a family, and will continue to grow this church together with everybody else. With that, we wish to thank everybody and encourage everybody that will continue with the great works we are doing for the Lord. Amen. I thank you. Amen. Thank you. Oh, I thank you so much. And uh, I hope you know just how what a blessing you've been to this congregation. And thank you so much for just sharing that. And so now I invite you where you are to just uh, stand up and turn to the people near you and uh, just wish them the peace of Christ. Um, if you see somebody that you don't know, make sure you give them a wave, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stand as you're able. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. 
As you are seated, I'll just remind you that we're not passing the plate these days, but if you want to make an offering to the church, there are if you have a check or cash, there are boxes out on that table in the middle. Uh, we also have an online giving uh, through our website if you want to donate in that way. Some people mail their checks in. Uh, as I've said many times, we're equal opportunity. We'll just take it however, and we thank you for that. Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you for your presence, your prayers, your gifts and your service, all of that in the service of God. Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving that's printed in the bulletin. God of the living, with all your creatures, great and small, we sing your bounty and your goodness. For in the harvest of land and ocean, in the cycles of the seasons, and the wonders of each creature, you reveal your generosity. Teach us gratitude that we may honor each person and the gifts they bring to this community, that we may praise you in all times and places, that in the pleasures and pains of life, we may know the love of Christ and be thankful, that we may be bound together by your Holy Spirit, entrusting one another and all our life to Christ, that 
we may always and everywhere give thanks to you, O God, for all of our blessings. Amen. Uh, please remain standing for our closing hymn, Pass It On, page 572. <laughs> There will be uh, uh, coffee out in the narthex, and if you want to hang around and visit a while, that would be great. Make sure you talk to somebody you don't know, even if you know them a little bit, you know, talk to them. And uh, so I invite you now to receive this benediction. May the love of God go with you wherever God may send you. May God guide you through the wilderness and help you through the storm. And may God bring you back rejoicing at the wonders he's shown you. May God bring you back rejoicing once again into these doors. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.